hello, hello. Let's get going. Sound good? Let's go. Hello, I am Mayor Watt. And you are watching the hometown daily news show or listening to it. If you're downloading it from the podcast side of things, uh, we are doing episode 300 and it is October 27th, 2022. I've already selected a bunch of articles. Uh, I'll do a quick rundown of what hometown is. Hometown is a news aggregation site and hopefully a whole bunch of shows uh, here on Twitch. And yeah, I, it gets copied over to uh, the podcast and to um, YouTube for long term storage because I can only store 60 days here on Twitch. Um, that said, the podcast is forever. I have backups of everything. So um, if for some reason something happens where I have to host it uh, all myself. The, the podcast and video and everything can persist. Um, but you can get hometown daily news show everywhere. And uh, the way that hometown works is it aggregates uh, now over 200 news sources. Uh, some get turned off. Some uh, stay active all the time. Uh, but they all get funneled into six main categories create news education entertainment social and technology and in that there are 50 channels um, i will probably limit hometown to 50 channels because that's what i am interested in um, and sometimes the articles that the channels the shows themselves um, you know, kind of go in and out of popularity and so the news drops off entirely um, and i don't really think think in the macro sense of things. Um, I like having focused categories and uh, it helps me manage my information overload. And so I have things about music and movies and drinks and food and just a little bit of everything, uh, but it all gets consolidated into uh, the daily news stream. Um, and that's on the front page. If you go to hometown.com, um, I am working on it all, all the time. If you, uh, stumble across it and you don't like what you see and because it's broken or it's slow, let me know. Um, I don't think it's been broken any time in the last year, uh, but I am working on it all the time. Um, that said, hometown, it's a construction site. So let's get into the news and move past that. The very first article is in the word in tech. It is a channel that focuses on tech. Uh, eventually when it launches, it might be, um, first quarter of next year, 2023, where I launched this particular channel. I'm looking for a host. If you are interested in it, uh, or a co-host, you know, so you'll be up there and I'll be here or flip flop, whatever you want. Um, I'm pretty flexible about these things, but I want to launch 50 channels, 50 shows here on hometown. Um, and, uh, Obviously, they'll be ported over to YouTube and to podcast form as well. Uh, so get in touch with me if you are passionate about a particular topic that might be represented in Omtown, um, or you are passionate about one and you want to be part of Omtown. Um, get in touch. Let's see what we can do. The thing that I do with these articles now is I throw them over to Showbot, uh, which is basically um, a little apparatus that I've known about for a long time now, <laughs> since its inception. Um, but I never used it here and I've always, I, I've only been streaming for 300 days as a steady state. I did it sporadically over the years, but, um, if you type in Showbot, uh, exclamation point Showbot, you can go to, it'll provide a link to hometown.showbot.tv. There, um, you'll see a list of things that have been submitted. Uh, right now I am submitting the news articles that we talk about and then people can vote for those articles if they deem it worthy of their time, of your time. 
you're a listener or you're in my chat right now or you're a viewer over uh, the next 24 hours. But after 24 hours, I wipe it all out. But I keep it all in mind. Um, If anybody votes for something, uh, I will uh, keep it in mind when I parse through my news. And if something is of particular um, popularity or importance, uh, something of concern, we can talk about it in the next show. Um, or a later show if we want to spend some time doing some more due diligence. Um, This here is something that has been uh, apparently in discussion, but it's because of, well, some rules. Um, Apple flexes its control over the App Store. Apple's most impactful changes this week were new iPads or operating systems. The company also shook up the App Store with new rules and ad slots designed for Uh, wringing more money out of uh, its tight grip over the iOS ecosystem, according to the author, not me. Um, The the changes have big ramifications for developers, either forcing them to share more of their money uh, with Apple or deal with ads uh, that they don't like. And as developers have found in the past, they don't have much room for pushback. Um, That's largely true of any platform. (laughs) Uh, not particularly just Apple, but any platform. If you're a developer and you're using a platform uh, short of your own, yeah, you, it's you're bound by rules set by the provider of the platform um, until it turns into some antitrust or whatever fiasco, class action, la da 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 da. But that really amounts to well, <laughs> I've I've never never quite understood it. It's a give and take. Um, and, uh, you know, without the platform, the developers have no platform and without the developers, the platform has no developers and hence no platform. So arguably everybody has a different disposition as to what is acceptable for getting the juice (laughs) from the orange and is it worth the squeeze? Um, but uh, coming from somebody who has had apps on the store, but n- not for long. Um, uh, I'd rather have some than none. Obviously, if I'm trying to make a living, it's really rough if more gets taken away over time. Uh, the article says, uh, in its changes this week, Apple updated its app store rules to give itself a cut of some advertising revenue in social media apps and uh, purchase revenue from Web3 apps. The company also expanded the scope of its app store advertising in ways that further intrude in the presentation of developers' own apps. The most aggressive change was a direct shot at Meta. Now anyone who buys in-app ad from within the app itself, like a Facebook or Instagram boost to better surface a post, will have to use Apple's in-app purchasing system, sending a 30% cut of the payment to Apple. There's a carve out for ad management apps, but the broader effect is that a key purchase funnel now has to go through Apple. Hey, you know what? If you use Facebook's platform, what do you think you have to pay? You think it's all free? If I go into your house and I use your house to sell something, is it free? If I get in your car while you're driving around and I'm not your best bud, (laughs) is it free when I'm shouting that, hey, come over to this person's house and you can buy stuff? No, it's never free. Am I happy? No, I'm going to be losing some money. Sure. But I'd rather have 70% than nothing. And Take that carve out, (laughs) take that application out, take everything out of the Apple app uh, app store and nobody has anything. But there's a whole lot of discoverability inside the Apple ecosystem. It's a whole lot harder to get discovered on Facebook. It's a whole lot more difficult to get discovered on YouTube, on Twitch, on anywhere, on somebody else's platform, it's difficult. But when you use the system, guess what? You get discovered at some point. Maybe you get some viral growth. I'm talking about social viral growth, not 
biological, viral, anyway. But you can grow. Try spinning up your own platform. It is ridiculously expensive. Even running your own website and pushing marketing because you're not going to do it all on your own. You either have to go viral or you're going to die on the vine. So why should Apple or any other platform be a free service while everybody is making money? Why do you think Twitch is changing its dynamic? Why do you think that Facebook is introducing different rules and everybody is raising prices? Because well, things are costing more and people are making money, but not necessarily compensating the platforms for which they're being launched from. And every developer will say the same thing. Well, I'm not going to do anything for free. Well, neither will the platforms. Again, am I happy for it? No. But I'd rather have 70% than nothing and try and charge out into this <laughs> wild west of being on your own and uh it's just not easy it's really it's really not easy so you know pay 30 percent <laughs> you're using the platform to just massive growth anyway the article also continues to say that apple also takes a cut of nft sales with these new rules if an app sells NFTs, it must use Apple's in-app purchase or in -app purchase system. Apple even does the refunds on the back end. So, I mean, Apple isn't just a slouch sitting there going, thanks for the money. It's providing everything from end to end. Even the coding itself makes it for somebody that's somewhat skilled in the art of software engineering make in-app purchases drop dead simple. Anyway, I forgot to mention that this article is by Jay Peters over at The Verge. Um, so yeah, if you're gonna use the platform, ta-da, guess what, you gotta pay for it. If you are making money, you know, I, I if I put my apps back up on the app store, I pulled them because I got tired of babysitting development. Um. But if I was making money on the site, guess what? Got to pay the wage, whatever it is. They're making money. You're making money. Everybody's putting food on the table. Anyway, so there's a whole lot more, I'm sure, to this and subtle context for an individual. But let's move on to the next article. I can't soapbox every article for 20 minutes. So um, this next article is over in the Mobile channel. Um, I'm actually doing uh, uh, something with Mobile that will force the cha a, a change in the focus of this, which really was just a, a socially driven news show, um, not from just my aggregator, but from uh, viewers, consumers of uh, the podcast and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm, it's always been in development and uh, I just never, <laughs> I never closed the loop, but now I'm working on it. So um, hopefully within the next year, I'll launch it. I got a lot of projects going on, but this article here in the mobile channel uh, says uh, Jim Cramer tears up and apologizes on TV for trusting Mark Zuckerberg as meta stock plummets. And yeah, it fell something like 30 bucks today. Um, uh, you know what? I don't have it up anymore. Dog on it. Well, anyway, um, Jim Mad Money Kramer, who's more flash than anything, um, whose accuracy is somewhere in the 30% range based on the last research that I saw about it, um, says um, he's made a career of giving stock market advice and really shouldn't in a signature brash style. So, it caught, off, uh, caught everyone off guard when Kramer teared up on CNBC on Thursday and apologized to viewers for promoting Meta stock. 
after it plummeted following yet another devastating earnings report for the company. Metastock reached a peak of nearly 400 per, per share in 2021, but has fallen uh, ever since amid a wired tech bubble that's burst in the last year. Yeah, I don't really, well, okay, I'll, I can't really say much about this. Uh, Jordan Pearson uh, over at vice.com uh, wrote this article. Uh, Kramer has boosted Meta during its downturn and emphasized his belief in Zuckerberg's vision, but on Thursday he struck a very different tone. Mad Money um, is n nothing more than Flash and some snapshot of a perception that may not be holistic. You can do technical trading, that's fine. Um, you're, you're, but you're not holding on to anything. When you do tech, technical trading, day trading, essentially, you're not holding on to it for any period of time. You're looking for arbitrage profit, either up or down. You're either buying it low and holding on to it for a short period, or you're buying it high and shorting it for a short period, but you're not sitting there hanging on to it for a decade. And so these little snippets from Kramer saying, hold on to this doesn't make any sense because all it is is a little snapshot of a bit of information built on who knows what, you know? And in this it's vision of Mark Zuckerberg, even during a downtrend. So I would wait for this thing to kind of do a dead cat bounce. Some people will buy into it again, driving the stock back up, hoping that somebody else will buy it from them in that margin. But I wouldn't, <laughs> I might go in the opposite direction of anything Kramer says. Um, but I am not a financial advisor. Um, my opinion is my own. And if you trade on my opinion, don't. Go and do your own due diligence. We can chat about it. We can sit there and make fun of a uh, stock or sit there and say, you know, hey, this looks good, but I'm going to go and do my own holistic analysis of this stock or a technical analysis of this stock. Um, but in no uncertain terms, do not follow Kramer because they are not going to be long term or even short term profitable decisions. Everyone's uh, a clock is right. A broken clock is right twice a day. So <clears throat> they say, uh, let me say this. I made a mistake here. I was wrong. I trusted this management team. It was uh, that was ill advised. The hubris here is extraordinary. And I apologize. Kramer said, OK, said Faber, what did you get wrong? And then he goes into it. Uh, they, he trusted them uh, not for myself, but uh, for that, I regret I've been in this business for 40 years and I did a, a bad job. I'm not proud. Yeah, I don't know where he gets his information from, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, big talking heads get information and they will make big money off of that information. Um, and uh, I 99% I, you know, of the rest of the population does not have access to this kind of stuff. Um, so I'm sure that you know, he'll come out of it rich, but nobody else will that follows him. Um, again, uh, again, unless it's the anomaly of, oh, look, I, I managed to follow this one stock and it went up. Um, anyway, Kramer had been a defender of Meta as recently as June of this year, encouraged CNBC viewers to buy the company's stock after interviewing Zuckerberg about his metaverse plans. Right. The interview is what made the decision. He appeared chummy with Zuckerberg saying, Mark knows I liked a garden. I watched a garden in VR, adding Mark Zuckerberg urged me to learn more Zen, uh, learn to be more zen-like before trailing off and leaving host David Faber baffled. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on to the next article. 
Uh, this next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Uh, it's about an, a Hatch Ideas is a business transformation show that I plan on starting. I've been talking about it for uh, the entire year. I've been wanting to do this on weekends, um, but I just can't. I get pulled away, um, but I'm working on it. Uh, I hope uh, <laughs> to, to start next year, um, but I'm making plans now, um, telling everybody to leave me alone. Um, <laughs> a lot of people kind of ping me constantly throughout the day and uh, it just can't happen if I'm going to be doing this so, uh, Amazon joins a big tech's dark forecast for the rest of the year it said next quarter sales will be less than expected and its stock plummeted 17% e-commerce king shares were down more than 17% in after hours uh, following the uh, company's announcement that fourth quarter sales will be well below the current Wall Street consensus. And that's the problem. It's about irrational exuberance on the part of external analysts ignoring what Amazon is saying as if the external analysts know anything. <laughs> so instead of conservative analysts being conservative about what the fourth quarter or first quarter or any quarter is going to be or year over year is going to be they pump it up make their money and when everybody else completely wets the bed with their money the analysts are the first movers because they're the one that's getting whole information or near whole information because they have people telling them information before everybody else gets it and it's not like analysts are devoid of investing. They can act on their stuff. They just can't do it unethically. Amazon expected fourth quarter sales to uh, to hit $140 billion to $148 billion below analysts view of $155.37 billion. This is fourth quarter sales not net profit. It also said operating income would be between a range of uh, a break even and something. Let me see if it will pull up in, in this article. This is a businessinsider.com article. Uh, Lakshmi Varanasi is the uh, author of this over at businessinsider.com. The tech giant posted an operating income of $2.5 billion, down from $4.9 billion in third quarter 2021. So year over year, down by half. Amazon's third quarter results come closer to analyst expectations. And Amazon shares dropped almost 17 or 20% according to the article, but uh, I think it's somewhere around 17, 18%. Um, let's see here. So it said that the operating income would be between a range of break even and $4 billion also under wall street expect expectations. So I'm not sure why it says up here that, um, Amazon's third quarter results came closer to analysts expectations. Um, cause fourth quarter is going to be down dramatically. Shares of Amazon uh, were down nearly 19%, but it's said in this article 17% and 18%. Alphabet saw shares drop 7% after posting third quarter results on Wednesday. Everybody is getting spooked by the recession that's incoming. And we'll get into where this recession is coming from because I've said it before, I'll say it again. And in, this, in these articles, we'll end up talking about it because it's driving home the point that I've been making for nine months. 10 months. Sorry, we're coming up on 11 months. Uh, my goodness, time flies. Still, the company plans to accelerate spending on the metaverse in 2023. That's meta. And uh, shares of Amazon were down to 89.86. But there's just a metric ton of them in the channel anyway. So 89.86 isn't bad. The, the valuation for Amazon is irrational too. Uh, but some people will say, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's much like the valuation for Tesla. It's irrational exuberance, not built on fundamentals. It's on the long term, but the long term is already valued in. 
to the price. It's already included. You're not going to make a lot of money on Tesla. Not if you're investing now. Let's move on to the next article. Uh, this too is in uh, the Hatch Ideas channel. Intel announces up to $10 billion in cost reductions through 2025. That's a lot of money in two years. Intel said that it intends to find cost reductions and efficiencies worth up to $10 billion through 2025. Uh, but guidance for the full fiscal year came up short. Um, I'm going to read that as there's going to be a lot of people getting fired um, and consolidations of resources so that the redundancies are excised from the enterprise. Jordan Novit over at CNBC is the author of this article. Um, so let me let let me touch base here. So. Um, as of right now, Dow futures are down, S&P futures are down, uh, NASDAQ futures are down, oil is down. We'll get into this oil issue. Um, so before I started the stream for the five days um, from today, back five days, Bitcoin is up 1,183, but it's down today 385. Um, so it's sitting at around the $20,300 or $400 range. Um, to me, uh, I don't, I've said this before as well, um, I don't think that um, Bitcoin will hit $25,000 anytime soon. It just won't. Um, in fact, I think it might actually drop to about $15,000 with government oversight, um, leaning hard on regulating uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, the, the wild west of crypto is disappearing fast. Um, but let's get back into this article because now we know where the stock market is. Um, how is Intel going to save $10 billion? Well, they're probably going to end up automating a lot of stuff. That initial expenditure is going to translate into reduced human capital, which costs a tremendous amount of money. And there is very little return on the investment because the salaries that go out to people, $80,000, $150,000, $250,000, or somewhere in the lower range between $35,000 and $80,000, that's not all of the story. That There's so much more that an enterprise has to pay for humans. Um, but they don't have to pay that much for automation. So I'm suspecting that Intel is going to focus its money on automation. Um, and um, what I had told various people 20 years ago, invest in micronization technologies um, and you will make your money back um, you know, in multitudes, by multitudes. And, um, you know, some people kind of giggled at that. And, and I told people to invest in, in Apple uh, 20 years ago. And some people poo-pooed that and others are now much richer for it. So, um, but it's private conversations. You know, I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not your attorney. I'm not um, your estate planner. I'm just talking about the news. And when I see something like uh, trying to save $10 billion in cost reductions, it's not going to come from something purely mechanical. Something else has to disappear. Uh, Intel shares moved as much uh, as 7% higher in extended trading on Thursday after the chipmaker announced lower than expected earnings guidance for the full fiscal year, but said it will deliver up to 10 billion dollars in cost reductions and efficiency improvements you don't say hey we missed our target and then say hey we're going to reduce our uh costs um and suddenly people go oh yay without uh the more holistic analyst sitting there going how the hell are you going to save 10 billion dollars well Overall revenue declined 15% year over year in the quarter, which ended in October uh, 1st, according to the statement. 
In the previous quarter, revenue declined 22%. The company's net income at $1.02 billion was down from $6.82 billion in the year ago uh, quarter. I think that this is an artificial scarcity thing in manufacturing overseas. Um, can I prove that? Nope. Why? Because everybody's blaming uh, COVID and uh, resource raw materials uh, being stuck in a supply chain. And I just I think it's laughable at this point. Um, but again, that's just me. Um, I think that the supply chain is being hobbled um, and uh, there's a lot of money in the system. So suddenly things are more expensive and producers are making bank. We'll get into it as we go through the news. I point in that direction because that's how I have the news stacked in my browser. Um, at any rate, the company's client computing group, uh, which includes PC chips, generated $8.12 billion in revenue, down 17%, but above $7.58 billion consensus among analysts polled uh, by a street account. And that's because prices went through the roof. Um, but it was still down. Anyway, um, technology industry researcher Gartner said that in the third quarter, PC shipments declined almost 20% after two years of consumer buying uh, computers to work, study, play games from home during the pandemic. Shocker. And we can still work from home, but our employer is going to allow us. Uh, the company's data center and AI segment, including server chips, memory, and field programmable gate arrays, posted $4.21 billion in revenue, down 27%, and lower than the street account a consensus of $4.67 billion. Again, irrational exuberance for evaluation during uh, a pandemic trending towards a recession. There's a lot of irrational exuberance, folks. So let's move on to the next article. This next article is in the Stock Marketeers uh, channel, which is uh, basically a, a stock kind of like Jim Cramer without all the flash and uh, <laughs> well, without all of the Cramer. Anyway, what's worth streaming? Here's everything um, new coming to Netflix in November 2022. And it's in here because it's coming from Market Watch. Um, I think that it's really interesting. Um, Netflix is doing kind of a, well, they're doing an ad based version and there's now, sorry, the, the subscription is ad based. So they're trying to capture people who can no longer afford the three more dollars that is the uh, margin between the ad based solution and the first tier single streaming category for their um, subscription. And then it's $15.99 for the four screens, but not 4K. And then it's 20 bucks for the 4K. And I think it's unlimited streams. I don't remember now, uh, but you can download and stuff like that in the standard and the uh, $20 version of it. Anyway, um, they're always taking stuff out and putting stuff in and you never know what is really going to be there unless you go hunting for it. Um, so when I found this in the stream, I said, Hey, let's grab it. Let's talk about this. Um, it's been updated, uh, first published on the 26th and then edited on the 27th. Sometimes the article changes its title. It's very frustrating for me, um, but it says here's everything new coming to Netflix in November 2022 and what's leaving. You'll want to go over to this article and uh, scan through it because I won't be able to go through everything, but it's in the chat. It's in the show notes when it gets posted. Um, I'll try and do it tonight so that there's no. Um, well, I'll, I'll be able to put the URLs in the show notes tonight after the show. Um, but they'll be available through Showbot. If you go to hometown.showbot.tv, you'll, or you hit exclamation point Showbot, you'll get taken, well, you'll get shown the URL and you can follow it and look at the URLs. 
um, even as they're posted. So if you find this interesting, uh, follow the Showbot URL and vote it up so that I can make sure that I include this. This would normally be in um, the continuity report channel, which talks about movies and, and streaming services and, and basically entertainment. Um, but uh, this was grabbed by my more business centric uh, aggregation. At any rate, on the drama side, um, there's 1899 and Manifest and Elite, and there's a documentary called FIFA Uncovered. Um, digging into the scandal plagued organization behind the World Cup, there's always something going on about FIFA nowadays. Um, really well anyway I, I won't get into fifa but um let's see pepsi where's my jet a documentary about a man who sued pepsi in the 1980s to get a free harrier fighter jet and uh, the fifth element uh, sorry element the fifth installment of the great baking great british baking show holidays um which is a special and a new comedy special from the outgoing Daily Show host, Trevor Noah. I wish you would. And Enola Holmes 2, which has been plastered on um, Netflix for a while. Um, apparently, I have never watched it. I've watched a couple of episodes right on the very beginning of it. It's a, it's a sequel to the hit 2020 movie about Sherlock Holmes' younger sister. Um, but I don't remember. Um, there's a TV show that I watch or watched a couple of times. So there's a bunch of stuff um, over on Netflix, like The Crown returns for its fifth season. This is just me scanning through this so that if you hear something there you're interested in, you can go over to Netflix and watch it. Um, but they have a list and that's what's really important. You'll want to go over to Market Watch and scan through it all. Um, they've got regular TV shows and a bunch of movies. Um, it's by day uh, throughout November. Pardon me. I gotta scratch my eyeball. Um, let's see. I don't know if um, if it's gonna make a big jump here or not. Um, Captain Phillips is gonna drop on November 6th in Netflix. Let's see what's gonna disappear. I'm really interested in that kind of thing. Um, hey, for you Teletubbies fans, Netflix family, it's got a category all to itself. There's going to be a Teletubbies um, posted in there, November 14th. <laughs> um, try not to be dead air, but there's so many things, and, and it's such a broad spectrum of interests that I think that you should probably go and just check it out. But on November 18th, Reign Supreme... Slumberland, Somebody, um, are all Netflix movies or series. Um, they drop a bunch on the 18th. Let's see what else. Uh, the Box Trolls on November 23rd. A bunch of Netflix films. Uh, if you're interested in Netflix specifically. Taco Chronicles Cross the Border, a Netflix documentary. It's just making me want tacos. And um, Wednesday, the Netflix series uh, Wednesday is dropping on the 23rd as well. If you haven't watched the trailer for uh, Wednesday, uh, go and check it out. It's pretty cool. I kind of dig it. Um, what I can't dig is the fact that Netflix will flag me... Um, when I stream the trailers for Netflix, I mean, they can bite me, bite my shiny metal butt. Technically, I'm a big pile of ions in Ohm Town. The town is uh, in the line of electrons flowing where. Anyway, it's a big, long world building thing. I'll get into it if somebody's interested. Anyway, let's get into the next article. Um, California's cannabis growing nuns pray for profits. 
I don't know how you cannot succeed in this market, although competition is brewing, <laughs> brewing, is growing. <laughs> I get it. I, in my head, I think I said growing for some reason, but, um, but growing, uh, the income, the sisters of the Valley make from growing cannabis is at half its pre pandemic level. Well, that can't be too bad. This is in the hatch ideas channel. Um, not everybody has the ability to, um, get a license to grow. Um, and with some, uh, federal, um, machinations here in the States, um, federal, well, in the States, you're not allowed to use the banking system. Um, and it's not federally insured. Everything is a cash account and it's kind of dangerous. Um, the money isn't insured and you can't basically get the benefit of the federal government protections that's changing here in the States. I don't know about everywhere else. Um, California's cannabis growing nuns pray for profits. As far as I can see, there are identical rows of crops uh, and the uh, occasional farmhouse or family home. One of these homes looks unassuming from the outside. There's nothing unusual about the building or the land around it, except that there's a small group of women wearing pristine white habits, burning incense. Incense? You sure it's incense? I'm sure it's incense. And singing hymns as they walk in uh, step blessing their cannabis plants. These women are the sisters of the valley, better known as the weed nuns. Well, apparently they aren't making as much money as um, before. They produce and sell all their own hemp based medicines and salves, a business that before the pandemic was growing 1.2 million a grossing, sorry, grossing 1.2 million a year. Um, apparently it's hemp but not weed, right? I mean, that's what I'm getting out of this. Do do do. There is a subtle difference there, folks. Um, let me see if I can find something else that says something. I, I might have to like do some more due diligence. Um, I know some about the business, uh, not every state allows it. Some states allow, it was kind of like a land rush to get um, permission to uh, start a, a business in um, medical marijuana that expanded into uh, recreational sales. Um, it says California is home to the so-called green rush of cannabis production. It was the first state to legalize medical marijuana in 1996 and recreational use uh, has been legal since 2016. The state, uh, the state's law, however, is full of regulatory loopholes, which means the legality of marijuana cultivation varies from county to county and city to city. So while it's legal to use cannabis in the state, nearly two thirds of California cities have banned marijuana businesses with others making it extremely difficult to obtain permits. Yeah, pretty much every state that allows it to some degree makes it somewhat difficult it's because they don't want every tom dick and harry to just spin up a grow farm um anyway uh they could have shut me down by now just because it's illegal to grow hemp in this county yeah but cannabis never mind i Sister camilla carefully pours super strength cbd oil into tincture bottles if you've never used uh, CBD, you might be surprised. There are a lot of people that swear on it to help them uh, sleep or calm their nerves throughout the day. Kind of fascinating. Um, and uh, you can actually do micro dosing of THC in some places. Well, theoretically everywhere, but not employers. Employers don't necessarily allow it and it turns into a legal battle. Um, anyway, despite praying for and blessing every batch, they're now making half of their pre pandemic, um, profits, or I should say sales of 1.2 million. So no slouch there, but California is expensive. Uh, the initial application fee for a retail license in California was a thousand dollars. It's much more expensive to get a liquor license. Um, after that, there are annual 
state administration and regulatory fees that can add up to tens of thousands of dollars for small businesses and close to $100,000 for larger operations. The illegal trade in marijuana is estimated to be worth around $8 billion. No wonder uh, everybody says just legalize it and stop criminalizing something that is um, odds on better for you than alcohol and uh, less dangerous than alcohol. <clears throat> you probably won't see people jumping in cars stoned and uh, racing around on the freeway, um, not unless they're being chased because cops want to arrest you for having a joint. Anyway, um, yeah, and, and this goes into this. Our, our article goes into the whole idea of people getting arrested for cannabis offenses. Uh, now embrace legal businesses. And uh, so far this year, California has received nearly $580 million in tax revenue. And Chief Rubin believes easing regulations would lead to more revenue for a city and help his department's efforts to eradicate the illegal trade. Um, yeah. Um, but hemp was made illegal, uh, not because of the pot side of it, but because it was a threat. Uh, my understanding is that it was a threat to cotton. Um, but yeah, let me see if I can find um, articles on that because it's a historical thing that goes way back um, and may, may be anecdotal um, because nobody's going to sit there and say, hey, uh, outlaw hemp um, because it's a threat to um, cotton. Um, that would be saying the quiet thing out loud and cause problems. Anyway, the next article is in the word in tech. Asus is, 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 is a foldable laptop is going on sale for $3,500. I guess this is chasing the long tail of Apple. Wildly expensive laptop. Uh, Asus is, uh, yeah, the way to say Asus. Asus. Asus's first foray into the world of folding screen laptops, the ZenBook 17 Fold OLED, is now on sale for $3,500, the company has announced. Um, it's being sold via B&H and Newegg. I wouldn't touch Newegg now. Um, though, as of this writing, only Newegg seems to have the laptop available, and yeah, probably because people are starting to question Newegg. Um, that aligns with the Q4 target given uh, to the author of the site, which is The Verge, uh, when they reviewed the laptop in August. So let's just jump over to Asus. Uh, foldable laptop goes on sale for $3,500. It's written by John Porter over at, uh, over at The Verge. And uh, it's a 17.3 inch display, 2560 by 1920, which is great. Um, or you can bend the screen to get two 12.5 inch 1920 by 1280 displays bump bump look at that thing what i don't like about folding screens is at some point there's going to be a crease in there no matter how much of an arc you put in there it's going to start to fail at that flex point even ribbon cables in a hinge do that i mean it's it's crazy um, so I don't think that I will ever buy, oh gosh, I got too, I flew too close to the sun, which is the fold on the Verge's site. Um, so it says, that's not to say the laptop is perfect. Monica encountered a fair few hardware and software bugs in her time with the ZenBook 17 Fold o OLED, uh, which aren't acceptable on a laptop at this price. And while it's decently specced with an Intel i7-1250U, 16 gigs of RAM, one terabyte SSD, and a 75 watt hour battery. It still struggled when used with uh, even moderately intensive apps like Lightroom. Yeah, I'd rather have a, I'd ra I don't know. <laughs> I'd rather have a, an M2 uh, MacBook Air or Pro. Um, it just seems to, <laughs> Everything seems to work faster on my Apple devices, um, except for business apps. Like I can run virtual machines all day long on an i7 um, with 16 gigs of RAM, 
multiple VMs with 32 gigs, I never have a hiccup. In fact, I'm running a different stream on a different computer right now where it struggled with eight gigs, but I moved it to 32 gigs of RAM and it's been streaming for, well, since it last reset, uh, 116 hours uh, straight without a glitch. So, well, with less than 1% drop frames over that 116 hours. So PCs have a place. I don't know. There's something going on with this laptop if it's struggling with Lightroom and 16 gigs. But there's a lot of context that's missing from this, like how big the document um, or how big an audio file is or how big whatever it is you're working on. Um, whatever the project is in Lightroom, um, you're going to you have to give more for us to feel like there's a real serious issue here. Um, but folding screens, I don't think that they're ready for prime time just yet. Not in the fact, not in the way that it's being presented. A fixed single point that's constantly flexing. I would rather have the whole screen roll into a tube and then I can just snap it all the way out and have it lock into place um, at least it's not folding in on itself in one fixed spot all the time and all of that stress is is rolled up into a cylinder um, and then i can just walk around with you know a small cylinder anyway um, let's go on to the next article uh, Unilever lifts sales goal for third time this year after hiking prices by 12.5%. How about that, folks? This is not something that should be happening when we trend towards a recession. Um, Unilever lifted its revenue forecast for the year after hiking prices 12.5% in the third quarter while sacrificing only 1.6% in volume. You know what that means, folks? Uh, Steve Goldstein wrote this article over at Market Watch. Uh, what it amounts to is all they ended up doing was losing 1.6 in volume, but they made 12.5% in prices. The price rise, according to Bloomberg News, uh, was its largest ever. Helped make uh, helped the maker of Hellman's Mayo and Lipton Ice. Uh, record what it calls underlying sales growth of 10.6% for the third quarter, which was ahead of consensus estimates of 8%. Its overall revenue rose 17.8% to 15.8 billion euros or 15.9 billion US dollars. The economic macro, sorry, the global macroeconomic outlook remains mixed and we expect challenges of high inflation to persist in 2023. So let's get our money now. Oh wait, that's not what they said. That's not what the CEO of uh, uh, Unilever said. That first part, yes, the global macroeconomic outlook remains mixed and we expect the challenges of high inflation to persist in 2023. I added, so screw you, we're getting our money now. Inflation in the Eurozone is running at about 10% year over year and at around 8% in the US. That's not quite consistent with the facts. You suppress the wages and you add to it CPI uh, year over year inflation and you're looking at 11% in the United States. Unilever now sees its full year underlying sales growth to be 8%. Yes, see? So inflation of 10%, they make more money 8%. So not only are they not losing any money, but they're actually taking more from you. Why? Because Unilever is a producer. They gather the raw materials and produce goods. They are a producer. They're not some, they don't take something from somewhere else. Um, no, they they own the production, the means of production. They, they are the ones that get the material from areas that they own and they bundle it together and then they sell it to somebody else that sells it to somebody else that sells it to somebody else before it hits retail, as well as selling it directly in their own supply chain to retail chain. Um, and throughout all of this, instead of having smaller margins and the executives and stakeholders and well, stockholders and executives taking a pay cut 
and not even a pay cut. Don't take as much. <laughs> don't give yourself a raise. Don't, don't take home millions of dollars. No, they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna make you pay more to survive. Um, because that is that you know, end stage capitalism. Um, it's, I think that it's sociopathic to do this kind of stuff three times in a year. Crazy. Anyway, that's Unilever for you. Now the next article is in the word in tech. This tablet pairs an e-ink display with a 16 megapixel rear camera. Not even heard of this before. Uh, so I thought that it was interesting to uh, discuss real quick. The Books Tab Ultra is a $600 e-ink tablet from Onyx that pairs a 16 megapixel rear camera with a 10.3 inch uh, uh, paper link display. I'm not sure if that's correct. Uh, an e-ink display, I suppose. It's an odd combination. The tablets uh, already have a bit of rough reputation when it comes to photography and e-ink displays aren't exactly known for their color accuracy or high refresh rates. Two features that are pretty important when taking good photos. So what's going on? Let's take a look at this. This is over at The Verge. John Porter again is the author of this. Um, but it's really just a, a, a paper white a laptop. Looks like it. Uh, the truth is a lot more sensible than it initially seems. Onyx is pitching the books, B-O-O-X, by the way, a Tab Ultra as a device for professional and business usage where it thinks a rear camera might be helpful for scanning documents with support for OCR. Turn on the rear camera to take a picture of your document and convert it into text right away is how the manufacturer's website describes the feature. Oh, again. The Verge just... Never mind, I'll skip it. Let's just get right to the article again. Um, Onyx isn't the first company to have announced an e-ink device with a camera like this. Earlier this year, a company called Big Me, I guess if you're going to do this e-ink device camera combination, you got to start your company with a B, um, announced a similar tablet with a color e-ink display and launched it on Indiegogo. According to Big Me's campaign page, it hopes to ship the e-ink note color next month uh, don't count on it um, but that's just me again making a call based on my history with indiegogo campaigns um, beyond its campaign the books tab ultra uh, is a similar tablet to onyx's existing note air 2 plus wow. um, it's powered by qualcomm's octa-core cpu which in Nantech reports is a Snapdragon 662 with a 6300 milliamp hour battery, 4 gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of expandable storage. Um, and its software is based on Android 11. So it's an Android device with an e-ink display and a camera for business purposes. And the last article for today is just riffing off of the rest of what I've been saying with these other mega corporations. And uh, I had somebody say to me, well, you're focusing on all of these mega corporations. And I said, well, all it does is scale down. It only gets worse as you move up. So I'm actually kind of pointing at those, you know, those corporations, but it just scales down smaller and smaller amounts. A small business is not going to be capable of demanding uh, a large sum of money for a product or service that they are in command of. It's not possible because they've got other competition or they don't have enough customers where they can sit there and raise the price by 12.5%, but only lose 1.5% of their uh, sales. I mean, that's my point. There's no bargaining power when the suppliers from at, at the foundation of the uh, economy say we're jacking our prices up so high that the middle class is going to suffer greatly and the wealthy have no problem just handing out their money because they're making more money off of the interest of their investments. Just the pure profit off of their investments, they could live on the, the 
the people that I'm talking about are so rich that they are immune to these inflationary trends, you would literally have to uh, make irrational claims about a plethora of people before you lose your billionaire status if you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> anyway, Shell reports earnings of $9.45 billion. The oil and gas giant said it had avoided uh, Britain's windfall tax because of big capital expenditures in the North Sea. Yes, that's right. Shell and Total oil giants report huge profits on high energy prices. The two European companies reported earnings totaling nearly $20 billion, partly on higher energy prices as Russia's war in Ukraine continues, which I think is, well, anyway, I'll just leave it alone because I think that this really isn't impacting their profitability is built on exploiting the conflict to raise the prices when really what should be happening, a responsible corporation for society to move from left to right would have a smaller profit, not raise the rates to the point where it is for shell. The profit was a step down from the record breaking 11.5 billion. It reported for the second quarter when it received an average of just over a hundred dollars a barrel for oil compared to 93 in the third quarter. Shell and Total, like other energy companies this year, are benefiting from high oil and natural gas prices, partly stoked by the war in Ukraine as Russia squeezes gas flows to Europe. But if you look at the very beginning of this article, it says gargantuan profits continue to roll in at Europe's energy giants. London-based Shell reported adjusted earnings of $9.45 billion for the third quarter, its second highest profit on record. And on the same day, Paris-based Total Energies reported a profit of $9.9 billion. So oil is not $100 a barrel. Um, depending on... Let me pull it up here. Actually, I may not be able to because I might have closed it. Uh, yeah. Doggone it. Yeah, I closed it. But anyway... Um, it, it isn't a hundred dollars a barrel. So it's somewhere around 80. Um, they're making bank and they're charging more at the pump <laughs> all around the world. Again, these are the producers, right? And these are the companies that set the trend for inflation. Because if you look at the price for gasoline, particularly diesel, you can match it to the massive jump in the cost for things like wheat and pretty much everything else, the consumer price index um, and many other other knock on resources are bound by the price of oil and gas. It is the fundamental input. So if you know where gas is trending, you know that the price for everything is going up and you're getting massive profits during a pandemic and now trending towards a recession. How many times do I have to say this? We need to stay at home, <laughs> telework. We need to switch to uh, solar. We need to switch to wind. I've got people that argue with me about the damage that it does to um, birds and whatever else. And it pales in comparison to the environmental impact of uh, combustion engines and the toxic wastes that are produced from drilling for oil and <laughs> uh, fracking and so many other things. Yeah, we need wind energy. We need solar. We need... Uh, focusing back on nuclear power um, and, and we can avoid things like, uh, well, there's, 
nuclear related issues have not happened in the United States and Europe. It, it, it's happened in a couple of places where it was a massive natural disaster and they didn't have enough uh, biological shielding or it's in a, uh, a site where they completely neglected to have a bio shield, uh, you know, an eight foot thick wall built around the containment system um, for the nuclear, the, the nuclear material. And when it steam blew its top, guess what? You have fallout all over the place. But it was because of not doing the things that other places did. We need to change this. So we'll see what happens. Um, we've got, you know, news day after news day, monitoring to see uh, what the trends are. And uh, happy to discuss it with anybody in chat here on Twitch. Um, I, I don't really post anymore over on Twitter. Um, we'll see after tomorrow what happens to Twitter stock and Tesla's stock. Um, but here we go. It's going to be Elon Musk's wild ride uh, starting tomorrow. So take care, you all. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.